and welcome back. It's now 10 minutes away from 7 o'clock and as promised before the break, we have been joined by the Executive Director of Friends for Conservation and Development, Rafael Manzanero, to talk about some of the activity that we see happening in the Chiquibo. Good morning it's and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, Rafael, generally, we know that FCD does quite a bit of work in there and uh, over the last two years I'd say you've gotten quite uh, a bit of support to uh, further the work that you have there. Let's start off there talking about uh, the resources, how they have improved and how that has uh, to some extent made the work that you do as FCD um, a bit more comprehensive. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, in terms of the last two years, um, indeed, as a result of the Teleton, um, we managed to get um, from a beginning number of six, and um, we were able to increase up to 18 in terms of rangers in the field. So that basically meant really a triple, um, I mean, sort of an effort um, to be put on the ground. As I've always noted, in order for a country to be able to govern its land, then you basically need a presence. And in the case of the Chiki Bull, um, it was really important that, um, um, that we would have the numbers. Of course, our park manager, Derek, would always say that we would require some 33 guys on the ground. Uh, but, you know, I think um, wow. actually moving from 6 to well, 18, are, yeah. that's already a, um, a big increase. Yeah. yeah. You're almost halfway there now. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, despite all of that, though, there are still challenges that exist. So let's start talking about some of the recent uh, challenges that we see that uh, seem to be uh, ballooning in terms of uh, what's happening in the Chiki Bowl. I think two of the main um, you know, issues of concern to us at this present time would include um, the Milpa Farms, and then the second one is the gold panning. Um, as how we have been reporting before, in the Chiki Bowl is a dynamic movement. Yeah. So all throughout the year there are um, you know, areas that would tend to increase and other ones would lower in terms of the threats and challenges. So it's seasonal? Exactly. It is okay. seasonal. Um, but some of the issues, you know, for example, milpas, we have not been able really to contain it over the last many years. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of gold panic, which started four years ago, it is still increasing and we have not been able really to control it. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, at this particular time, you know, milpas, and even though we already know and we already have, lo um, um, have been able to look at from the historical context, you, you mm -hmm. know, we recognize that as soon as January is already coming in, then the dry weather is setting and those the people are preparing for, for cutting and removing the forest in order to plant. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this has been something, and in fact one of the, <clears throat> in one of the bar graphs that I brought, um, I mean you can see how it has been moving from the 1980s and way up to 2015 and 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is something that we basically would know that um, it is seasonal, but yet we have not been able to prevent it in advance time. Yeah. And that's a problem. Now it's, it's in addition to seeing the establishment of farms and uh, the continuous gold panning, we know the chate takes place, the chate harvesting takes place, uh, we've seen the poaching of animals, but along with that we've seen where uh, the investment is made by the Guatemalans to establish their own road systems and even put up dwellings as well. Mm -hmm. What is the situation now in terms of that? I remember once you brought an aerial shot of how far the roads were coming into Belize at this point. Yeah, um, in terms of the network of trails and trucks, mm -hmm. um, you know, over the years as a result of the Chatero activity, up to some you know, 50, 55 kilometers of of a sort of pathways would have been opened. Um, in fact, as how you might recall, um, you know, some of the descriptions mm -hmm. given by Guatemalans of having volcanoes in Belize yeah. was basically meaning that they had reached way as far to the Coxcomb Basin. Yeah. And so, you know, they were able to move in across the landscape you know, over the years. Um, in terms of the dwellings, um, I mean, these are not really concrete walls like this. Yeah. Uh, but what you find are basically huts and then eventually the people start to move in with their families and then they tend really to start to own the land. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you know, this is illegal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are protected areas and because they are Guatemalans, then of course that's really an illegal entry. 
Um, you know, the question of having huts until today in the Chiki Bowl is one that I think for the public um, it still becomes a major issue mm -hmm. because it, um, I guess the question becomes so how is it that we cannot really be able to um, eradicate it? Mm -hmm. And why is it that we have not been able to move them out from Belizean territory? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, um, and I think that's really a good question because, I mean, technically, you know, they are in set of protected areas and they should be uh, um, actually move out from the area. So what happens when FCD identifies a dwelling in an area in the Chikabu? Uh, we would report it and because um, in many cases they are within the in what is known as the adjacency zone mm -hmm. then certainly um, it becomes a much more sensitive of a matter and thus the the idea of going into a joint forces um, of a program mm -hmm. in this case with, with the Belize defense force of course and the police and, and the OAS would be asked to verify it mm -hmm. and in many cases it has already been verified that it is in Belizean that territory. That it is in Belizean territory. Um, I gather from a couple of months ago, the impression was like, um, well, you know, we cannot really move them out because we don't have the money really to pay them so that they can be relocated to Guatemala. Now, of course, that's also another problem because all of our counterparts in Guatemala would tell us that in reality, you know, they are illegal and they should be actually moved out from the area. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one question I had. Um, in terms of because we've spoken quite a bit about the cross-border efforts uh, to talk about preservation and conservation so when you find a, a dwelling like that and you have a statement like that um, what's the effort on that side of the border to relocate the individuals um, in the past, as I remember, even the, the, the municipal alcalde from El Chernemencos, um, he had noted that um, he would be available in terms of ensuring that the community can have another portion of land, another parcel of land, and also to buy the zinc or whatsoever really for the, for the person to be accommodated in Guatemala. But importantly is the effort that we have to do here. Mm. Because, and that is where, you know, we feel that we have to be much more bold in terms of moving these people out because... Uh, so to be clear, neither the persons who live in the dwelling nor the dwelling is moved at this point? At, at this point in time, um, there would be some people that are located still in of Belizean territory. Um, and they would tend really to be shifting also. Yeah. But eventually, if left you know, alone, of course, they would maintain it as a permanent and hot in area. And it's a home base for the illegal activities that, I mean, it's fair to assume that it's a home base uh, for the illegal activities that they do do in the Chikibu. Um It is a home base, but also it encourages others also to start to come in as well. Okay. Now, you speak about this being an area of concern, and I know that uh, you have never been fearful about sounding the alarm uh, as to how the, the infringement within the Chiquibu continues to move further and further into Belizean territory. If you were to say uh, within the past year uh, how much forest was lost and how many uh, new areas you see that the Guatemalans are utilizing for their own purposes, uh, what is the growth? In the case of the Chiquibu forest, um, you know, which includes the caracol, mm -hmm. um, we noticed actually two weeks ago that there were 17 of the areas that had um, already been cleaned or mm -hmm. cleared. Um, you know, over the years, what we have been able to document is that approximately 200 hectares are destroyed every year mm -hmm. in terms of an average number. Mm -hmm. And whenever we start to look at that figure, we are looking at about 500 and 550 acres of forest. And now, in terms of the value of what that basically means, um, you know, only because of the carbon stocks mm -hmm. that are disappearing as a result of the forest being cut, we also have been able to do a, a, a sort of a, of, of a record that um, you know Belize would be losing over one million dollars, you know, only on the carbon stocks. Uh, and in that case, we are not looking at the timber resources mm -hmm. in terms of the wildlife, in terms of the land, um, um, of the land use. And mm -hmm. so in reality, only in carbon stocks, we're losing over $1 million, I mean, worth of it you know, over the years yeah. as an annual basis. And so we have lost quite a lot. Um, and there's also a picture that um, 
you know, I put on the folder where you can see in terms of the projections. Mm -hmm. So the projections Continue. demonstrate that this would, if we are not able really to control this, then practically all of that zone on the western border would basically be already increasing up to three kilometers or so yeah. of an area that would be already altered. Mm -hmm. So it would be the red area? Um, yes, exactly. Okay, so in that red area, if we look into projections for the next 10 years or so, um, I mean, that's how it would look. And so we are looking at three to four kilometers. If left alone, if left alone, I mean, the guys would be able to reach way down to Caracol, where you have the big temple. Mm -hmm. um, and so practically, they can be taking over a lot of these lands. Um, and what also it means is that if we are looking at one kilometer you know, right along the western border, you know, from north to south, I mean, technically, and the usage of the land right now, as we speak, I mean, basically, that has already gone over the what we consider now in terms of acreage of the one kilometer, you know, all along the western frontier. Mm -hmm. Now, and so it's quite a lot. Yeah. And besides being worrisome, uh, the engagement. What happens when uh, you find these illegal uh, milpas? Um, do you have engagements with the milperos, and uh, how? What is that like? Is it contentious? Um, over the years, um, it used to be much more in terms of a passive mode, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the people were just asked to abandon their place and to return back again to Guatemala. Or secondly, um, they would be asked um, you know, to harvest the last crop and, and they would be asked uh, not to return back again to Belize. But of course, those things have not worked. Um, it was until um, on the month of November that we practically actually started under a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service program for the first time only to target the milpa farms along the western border. Mm -hmm. And what we did was basically to put more effort to be able to coordinate better with the Belize Defense Force and the police. For the very first time, one of the milperos was captured. For the very first time, you know, even after so many years, you know, from the 1980s. You see the evidence, but you don't always get the people. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, this guy was caught along with two kids, a nine and a seven-year-old, and this guy was brought out, and he was charged, um, which was, I think, quite fair enough, he was charged over $6,000. Mm -hmm. So $5,000 for the milpa farming inside of a protected area, and $1,000 for illegal entry. Um, you know, in the past, it did not really used to occur, and in fact, the maximum fine was five hundred dollars for any environmental um, illicit activity you know, in the country. But now, it basically has increased now quite a lot. In fact, a person can be fined up to twenty thousand dollars now, mm -hmm. and so we are informing the people now in Guatemala, you know, to be aware about this because anybody who is caught, and for this year now, we are putting more of the attention only to target the milpa farms. Now, and, and I wanted to touch on that because you've always spoken about your sister relations with uh, environmental organizations in Guatemala. And now through that partnership, you've been able to uh, put out messages to the Guatemalans directly about this illegal activity. Tell us about that. Um, all along the western border, there are a whole set of communities. And so in um, the partnerships that we have built um, is basically one really for the people to be better informed, but also that the leaders understand the true reality that we are facing because you will reckon that in the past, um, a lot of people really felt that, um, that somehow the people were being abused here in Belize, mm -hmm. or they felt that their rights were not really being um, um, enhanced and uphold. Mm -hmm. And so um, with the information now that is being put out there, and, uh, and also through the exchange programs, I think the community leaders are becoming much more aware that, yeah. that yes, there are laws that will be upheld here in the country. Um, in fact, you know, just over a week ago, um, we as FCD and BALAM, we signed another agreement as an extension of an agreement with the alcaldes you know, that are responsible for all the villages, actually from north, from El Chor de Mencos, way down to Halakte. Mm -hmm. The idea of that is basically to inform them about the true reality and the importance of the Chiquibo forest. Mm -hmm. And so um, it really has helped now really for them really to be much more aware about the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think it's going to serve as a deterrence, but that doesn't really mean that we have to feel you know, passive on the side. Yeah. We have 
and we actually have to enforce the law and we have to be much more bold in terms of, up, of upholding the regulations. The messages that you're airing at this point, it is talking what? about the possible uh, fines. fines? Yes. We have that, right? Uh, and yes, we have actually a and copy of that. Um, and it's in Spanish and It's in Spanish and in Kekchi. A lot of the people that are found across the border are basically Kekchis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this is being aired in four radios across in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. So, and the feeling of this is important because um, a lot of the people that we come about are really poor people. Yes. So at the end of the day, to put them in jail for six months or one year, um, you know, of course, in the context of yeah. the law, you know, if you if 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 you just simply didn't really know, I mean, that is really a poor excuse. Yeah. But at least we are informing no, it's an them. Educational. Exactly, it's an educational platform, and so that the people become much more aware. So it's really yeah. a begging them to ask themselves if it's worth. Exactly. Uh, the exactly. imprisonment because they wouldn't exactly. be able to pay the fine. Exactly, because now it can be up to $20,000. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would hope that that will serve as a true deterrence for these people. That has been, sorry, just to follow up on that one point, that has been one of the issues that we hear, uh, especially from the Guatemalan side, that the area is a very impoverished area um, and that the communities are really just looking for a form of livelihood. Mm -hmm. And while uh, we can be able to say, well, that's Guatemala's problem, mm -hmm. Uh, this is really uh, people that we're talking about, yeah. families, children. Um, what efforts have you seen? The, the, the foreign ministry, every time we talk to them, speak about trying to put more resources into the area so that the persons don't need to come into uh, Belize to do this Ill illegal activity. From your knowledge, what has been the investment in the area uh, since we, we have been sounding the alarm about the illegal activities in Chicago? I think the investment on the ground is still pretty much incipient and extremely small. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, am, I consider that as the people really discuss about the, either the politics or either the matter of, um, of the OAS engagement and involvement, or even the international friends of Belize mm -hmm. Guatemala, um, I mean all of this effort is not really percolating and reaching to the people on the ground, and that's yeah. really a true reality. Now, the people on the ground are extremely poor. In fact, you know, we speak about poverty in Belize, but across the border, there is extreme poverty. Yeah. Okay, these people don't really know where else to go. If they are not provided with an alternative means, which until now, it, you know, it is only incipient. Mm -hmm. And these are more like pilot programs. Um, and so the people, um, you know, they might be able to receive some funds, mm -hmm. but that is not really for the long haul. Yeah. And the land tenure is also completely skewed, and so people don't really own the land in neither. And so they have been reaching out, you know, across into Belize with the expectation that Belizeans might be able to give them land across in the Chiquibul and, and into other areas. Of course, that is unacceptable. Yeah. But the point is that um, it will only take really the big responsibility of the government of Guatemala really to look after its people. And how can that happen? It might happen through international pressure, I think. Um, with the U.S. and the British and the Friends of Belize Guatemala because essentially even though the people go and the diplomats go to Washington or other areas but on the ground we are still not really seeing those investments that people will require in order for them to go out and be able to be more on a governance program. Dara, and okay. One of the questions I had because you talk about the, the whole uh, resettlement that is necessary and the funds needed uh, to do that as well. So in some cases, the Milperos have established uh, home dwellings um, there. Um, does the law immediately kick into place now in terms of uh, the fines, etc., if they're, if they're found there? Um, yes, yeah. So why would there be a need uh, to pay or to um, to have them resettled. I think that is um, um, an extremely good question. I, you know, I myself don't really understand it. I think that you know, within the context of the law and even you know, within the confidence building measures, it is very clear that um, I mean, there is the stage one and stage two, and the whole procedure is outlined. Mm -hmm. um, and so, even whenever we go out to our Guatemalan counterparts, and we would say. You know, we have registered of seven um, or eight of the dwellings within um, the Chiquibu Forest. And um, apparently they might consider that we want their help. And what they tell us in, in, um, in retrospect is say, well, what are you guys waiting? 
you guys, you so have the Guatemalans your are telling you go ahead and move them. Exactly, of course. But it's and they believe that we need to do it. Within the adjacency zone. Well, and in some cases, I mean, the idea of being within the adjacency zone, it basically means that it needs only to be verified and confirmed that it is really within Belizean territory. Mm. I mean, that's the only you know, objective of engaging the OAS. Could the question of resources be the Belizean uh, capacity to get what is needed in there to move or to demolish the dwelling? Is that what your understanding is? I think we need really much more to be, um, I think it's just you know, more a matter of determination yeah. um, because it is not really that difficult mm -hmm. and you know, it is not really that complicated nor is it really remote. In many of these cases, you know, if we look at the Valentin, um, um, I mean, area in the, in, in the Caracol, you know, we can reach there in a matter of, you know, five hours. We, yeah. You know, we already can be there on location. Especially now in the dry season. Yeah. Rafael, we hear you once again, um, and I, I've said it several times in, in the show, uh, sounding the alarm, and you were saying uh, that we are following your, your last uh, review. We're seeing the clearing of arms, we have these dwellings that have not been relocated. What is it, before the cry was more boots on the ground, what is it that you would like to see take place to address this situation so we can reduce the level of deforestation that we're seeing? I think, um, I mean, the idea of the boots on the grounds um, is basically one that, um, I mean, the numbers of people and the strategic areas that we require to be. Um, it's still not really there as a country in terms of putting it on, uh, on the right locations. Mm -hmm. um, if you recall, the Prime Minister did mention almost three years ago of putting three conservation posts. Only one is up at the moment. Mm -hmm. The other two, um, you know, which is the area of South Sebara and Caballo, um, I mean, that area is still, you know, we have, um, and we actually have identified the location, we have found the water resources, um, it's just a matter of putting in the CP. The so, um, um, and that area is the main hotspot right now, apart from Caracol. Yeah. And so we already knew that we required to put a presence into that zone. Um, Have you been communicating to find out when the uh, timeline is for that conservation post to be Actually, installed? the timeline should have been actually some two years and a half ago. Is there any indication from the government at this point that it is in the pipeline? I understand that it has already been approved. Um, I don't know if the finances is there, okay. um, but I think that um, you know once again we go back again to the point of determination. If we really believe that that is really highly important, then it can be done. I mean, we have demonstrated before that if we want to do it in a matter of two months, you can have a CP. You know, it really can happen even in the remotest areas in the Chiquibol. Yeah. You know, if one really wants it, you know, even by horses you move everything in there. If one really wants it. Um, and so that's, I think, the, the true point behind all of this. Um, and so that CP is important, but also I think something important, you know, Marlene, is the point of, I mean, the boots on the ground is great, but I am now adding one other word, which basically is that we need the good boots on the ground, you know, which basically means that we need really that determined individuals to be able to do the work. Yeah. You know, you don't want only to put a CP and then you know, only for the people just to linger around. I mean, that is supposed to be an active CP, which basically means to be able to patrol, patrol. you know, north and south. Because what we have realized is that um, if you put a CP, the people will be able to be diffused. So mm -hmm. they can go either north or south. So one has to be able really to maneuver within that range. All right, and lastly, to close off our conversation, uh, ending on a more positive note, uh, the Maya Mountain Challenge kicked off this weekend, and this is, of course, uh, both an income generator for uh, FCD, but also a way to get international exposure about the work that you do. Tell us a little bit about the race. Yeah, the race um, um, is the second time that now we are running this, and this was done in partnership with American Adventure Sport. Um, it's actually 14 groups that were able to arrive now for this year. Um, it's really a very serious of a sport, um, and in fact, even our rangers who are involved in this with Derek and and um, and Boris and our guys, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Gina Lovell, also part of the team uh, from the BDF, um, you know, they have realized that this is really a very strenuous one. Yeah, it is so strenuous that your body will be able to suffer for sure. Mm -hmm. And you are going to get scars behind this thing, you know, even after the, you know, after the race. Um, it is already ongoing. Um, it is on its tour day right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's anticipated to finish probably tomorrow. Um, the last team should probably be arriving until Wednesday because some of the guys are really... Uh, so the winners will finish tomorrow? We are... Hopefully. <laughs> yes, exactly. We, we are actually hoping so. Yeah. yeah. All right. And of course, uh, usually it is, tele it is recorded and produced into a show that runs the following year. Um, yes, the idea also behind this is really to highlight about the importance of the Chiki Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, so this year, um, and thanks to Institute of Archaeology and um, the Forest Department, um, they were able to get also permits to go into some of these remote and wilderness areas, but okay. really of, of the wonderful features of the Chiki Bowl. You know, for example, they are going to the Chiki Bowl Caverns, um, you know, they are going to the Nohoshen, you know, sinkholes, um, and they went to Shenantonich and El Pilar and into other areas. And so we are hoping that it also can highlight about the importance of the Maya mountains, yeah. you know, through bringing the videos and, um, and the pictures home. Right. Yeah. Well, Rafael, we want to thank you, um, thank you very much for giving us this update today. And of course, we'll continue to follow uh, the work that you do, but also the legal um, settlements that are there. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Sure. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, it's to talk about how to extend the lives of the elderly with Help Age Belize. So stay tuned.